Good morning. Uh, we start with general questions. And question number one, Tavish Scott. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to ensure that there will be a legacy arising from the success of, of the Scottish competitors at the 2016 Olympics and Paralympics. Minister Aileen Campbell. Uh, I'm sure the whole chamber, chamber will agree that Scottish Olympians and Paralympians have had a great success at the Games in Rio, bringing back a total of 30 medals. To build on this, Sports Scotland will continue to use its investment from the Scottish Government and the National Lottery to develop its world-class sporting system, including investment in sports facilities for use by communities and performance elite, uh, athletes alike. These facilities are being further enhanced with the addition of our new National Sports Performance Centre, Orium, and the purpose-built, fully inclusive National Centre, Inverclyde, opening in spring next year. I'm also delighted that Hub uh, Sports Scotland has exceeded its aim of creating 150 sports, uh, community sports hubs across Scotland to date. 155 have been created, with a further £6 million investment, creating a total of 200 hubs by 2020. Tavis Scott. Thank you. Can I uh, thank the Minister for that reply and share his sentiments about the performance of our athletes uh, in Brazil? Uh, would you agree with me that the legacy that is important uh, is about our future athletes, particularly our young future athletes? Is she aware that this weekend in Glasgow, district hockey players are uh, there from across uh, Scotland uh, competing and training for the future? And would you recognise that for island competitors, that means the additional two nights away and the flight cost of getting to Glasgow for the weekend, which of course in itself will be uh, one Wonderful. But uh, would you recognise that the need for an island's travel fund, which I have been asking Sports Scotland to push uh, and to introduce, is paramount? And would you uh, agree to take that forward? Minister. Um, I thank uh, Tavish Scott for raising uh, this issue. Uh, and I know this has been an issue that he has pursued. And of course, I know through my own family connections, the, the challenges and barriers that uh, island life can uh, uh, face for young competitors. And I hope that whoever's going from Shetland uh, to the district hockey um, event in Glasgow do uh, well. Um, the issue around uh, funding for travel is something that has been ongoing, an ongoing discussion between Sports Scotland, COSLA and ourselves. And I'll uh, be, uh, give the commitment to Tavish Scott to update him on the progress of those uh, discussions and make sure that we uh, uh, meet to uh, further what, work out further what, what further action can be taken to uh, help uh, island competitors. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thanks to Tavi Scott for tabling the question of legacy. Uh, I attended the Team Scotland Sports Awards last night, and those of us lucky enough to be there cannot fail to be inspired by the incredible achievements of Scotland's sportsmen and women in 2016. On the back of the huge success of the Scottish contingent in the Team GB and Paralympic Team GB, our children have been eager to find ways to get involved, only to find clubs with ever-growing waiting lists. When discussing legacy, we often talk of increased participation without recognising that requires increased capacity. In short, we need more coaches and destinations to participate. Investment in our army of volunteers and PE teachers would be a fantastic legacy from recent games. Will the Scottish Government undertake to remove barriers to attaining coaching qualifications and look at opening up schools after hours, enabling easy access to facilities? Minister. I'm well aware of the, the barriers that may, many coaching, uh, coaches might uh, experience when they're trying to produce uh, opportunities for, for young people. And that's something that we have worked on uh, for some time. And that's why in my original answer to Tavish Scott, we've uh, invested heavily to create uh, and exceed our target of community sports hubs across the country with a further six million investment creating another 200 hubs by 2020. And working with the governing bodies and others alike with an interest in sporting opportunities and providing those opportunities for young people. Uh, I, again, you know, our, have a, we have a great commitment to making sure that young people have an opportunity to participate in, in sport and we'll do all we can uh, to ensure that that happens. But I think our record to date is an impressive one and our further investment in facilities across the country shows the direction that this government wants uh, to take, which is to increase uh, participation and activity for all across the country. Question number two, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how many local authorities have outstanding equal pay claims. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Signing officer, the Scottish Government believes that it is completely unacceptable for any equal play, pay claims against local authorities to remain outstanding. Uh, local authorities are responsible for the employment uh, of their staff and the Scottish Government is therefore unable to provide uh, details of outstanding claims. 
However, the Accounts Commission has indicated that councils estimate that about 30,000 equal pay cases remain outstanding and Audit Scotland plans to look at equal pay issues uh, across local government in more detail during 2016-17. Rona Mackay. Thank you for that answer. Um, in relation to that, can the Cabinet Secretary give an update on what action the government is taking to ensure equality for women in the workplace? Cabinet Secretary. Design officer, over and above our work to support and promote uh, equal pay, the Scottish Government uh, is involved in a wide range of actions uh, to tackle inequality for women uh, in the workplace. Uh, actions include um, promoting family-friendly, uh, flexible working, uh, high-quality and flexible childcare, uh, and we fund organisations such as Equate, uh, CareerWise and Close the Gap. And as well as our programme for government commitments uh, on women returners, uh, the new uh, Advisory Council on Women and Girls uh, and Pregnancy and Maternity Discrimination Working Group, uh, which will be chaired by Jamie Hepburn, uh, all of this work is to help ensure that we remove the barriers uh, faced by women in the workplace uh, over and top of the work that we will do uh, to tackle under-representation of women in public boards. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, the, the issue of equal pay has been raised in the Chamber uh, on numerous occasions, certainly in November 2015 and also uh, February of this year, and also the First Minister uh, has encouraged local authorities who have not yet uh, dealt with the outstanding claims uh, to deal with them quickly. But uh, can the Cabinet Secretary, uh, the Cabinet Secretary consider writing once again, I know the Scottish Government has done this before, but we should consider writing once again to local authorities, including Inverclyde Council, who have not yet uh, dealt with the outstanding equal pay claims? Cabinet Secretary. Mr McMillan raises uh, a very valid point. The issue of equal pay and outstanding equal pay claims has been raised in this uh, chamber many times. Um, earlier this morning, I met my constituent, uh, Rose Jackson, who is with the Scottish Pensioners uh, Forum, who is outside Parliament today. Um, and Rose was telling me how, prior to her retirement, uh, she was fortunate enough that her own equal pay claim was settled. But we know that is not the case uh, for tens of thousands uh, of women at uh, the length and breadth of Scotland. So, of course, uh, myself and the Scottish Government will consider what more can be done, uh, including uh, our manifesto commitment which speaks of a, a system of penalties uh, for local government uh, for those who have not settled by April 2017. Uh, but of course we can write again to our colleagues uh, in local government uh, and follow matters up. Uh, but there is other action that the Scottish Government has already taken, indeed allowing flexibility uh, for local government to use capital receipts uh, to settle um, and other action uh, in terms of abolishing fees for employment tribunals when that power comes our way. Question number three, Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of high street banks that have retail operations in Scotland and what was discussed. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Um, details of all ministerial engagements are published in arrears on the Scottish Government website. The data includes references to ministerial engagements with representatives of retail and high street banks from September 2015 to April 2016. Details of subsequent engagements will, of course, be published in due course. At these meetings, we discussed our mutual interest in supporting Scotland's economic growth. I will next meet with representatives from across the financial services sector, including the high street banks, at the Financial Services Advisory Board on the 4th of October. Gordon Linders. <coughs> I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister may be aware of research that shows that Scotland is losing more than 140 bank branches over an 18-month period, beginning in July 2015. More than 20 of these are in Edinburgh, including a Curry branch, which uh, is one of the branches which are commonly referred to as the last branch in town. Whilst I appreciate that retail operations may be the prerogative of the bank in question to be considered in the context of their overall operations, uh, branches play a wider role in society, particularly for the elderly or those less able or those in remote areas who are often unable to bank in other ways. Has the Minister relayed any concerns to banks operating in Scotland about the ever-increasing number of branch closures and the effect these closures can have on local communities. Minister Paul Willows. 
I will thank the member for his question. He raises a very important point, I, I, th I think particularly the reference to those who are elderly, who are maybe less able to use digital services or less equipped with the skills and confidence to do that. Um, I do recognise those concerns of, of, of his constituents and indeed members across the, the chamber as well will have similar concerns in their own constituencies. Uh, these of course will be worrying times for any branch staff who are directly affected by branch closures as well. Uh, I appreciate the bank, as Gordon Linders has indicated, must make commercial decisions and the way that people carry out their day-to-day -day banking is changing as people increasingly move to digital services. However, I do share his concern that banking con services must consider the needs of all in our society and there is a continuing need or uh, for face-to-face -face provision of banking. I made this point very clearly in, uh, in my uh, remarks in the debate, um, members' debate that was uh, led by Ian Gray <coughs> in respect of a closure in East Lothian. Uh, we would certainly welcome these points, such as the points made by Mr Linders, being uh, borne in mind whenever high street banks consider closures, especially where a branch is the last one in the community and especially where elderly customers may be affected. Question number four, Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government what action it, it takes to ensure that housing developments do not have a negative impact on the character and infrastructure of villages. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. It is uh, for local authorities, through their development plans, to direct the right development to the right place. Scottish planning policy provides a framework of guidance to support authorities, both in terms of promoting high quality development and a sustainable pattern of development. Tom Arthur. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and welcome that approach? However, many of my constituents in Brookfield, Howwood and Kilbarkin have raised concerns with me over the scale of housing developments in their communities. Can I therefore ask what further action could possibly be taken so that we preserve the individual character of villages, whilst of course ensuring that there is a sufficient supply of new homes? Um, thank you. Planning authorities have uh, responsibility for that development plan uh, and decisions on planning applications in their area. Uh, and Renfrewshire Council has published Renfrewshire's Place Resident Residential Design Guidance which sets out the objectives for sustainable placemaking within the area. Throughout the planning system, opportunities are available for everyone to engage in the development decisions which affect them, and all those involved in the planning system have a responsibility to engage and work together with communities and all stakeholders to achieve quality places. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are huge concerns in parts of East Lothian that housing developments will have a negative impact to health services, schools, public transport and so forth. Can the Scottish Government commit to an improvement in infrastructure before housing developments commence? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government recognises uh, that there is a need to improve the alignment of housing and infrastructure delivery uh, and for this to be addressed in development plans. Uh, this is a significant issue being considered in the ongoing work reviewing the planning system. Uh, we are working with a wide range of stakeholders to consider the options of imp for implementing the recommendations of the independent panel who reported in May. The output from this will be inform a planning white paper which will be published around the end of this year. Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. Whilst local authorities have responsibility for drawing up and bringing forward local development plans, it is for the Scottish Government to sign these plans off. Is the Minister aware that there is major delays in many areas in getting these plans signed off? And in the case of Fife, for example, £400 a day is what it costs the Council. It's now running into thousands of pounds. Will the Minister agree to look at this? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I am aware of the Fife situation, uh, and the Deputy Leader of Fife Council has written to me about this, uh, and I'll respond uh, accordingly. Um, there are some issues with the Fife plan. Um, the, our officials have uh, written back saying uh, that there are about 200 questions that need to be answered. But I can assure uh, Mr Rowley uh, that I'll respond to the Deputy Leader of Fife Council uh, and I'll let him uh, know how we progress with this matter. Question number five, Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Police Scotland regarding tackling hate crime. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Government officials and Police Scotland are in regular touch to discuss tackling hate crime. Police Scotland takes all forms of hate crime extremely seriously and monitors the level and type of incidents being reported on a daily basis in order to provide the most effective and robust response to safeguard victims 
and community groups. At this time, they have not seen any significant increase in the level of reports being received since the EU referendum in June. We would encourage anyone who believes they may have been a victim of hate crime to report it to the police, either directly or through their network of third-party reporting centres. Sandra White. I thank the Minister for that reply. The, the Minister may be aware of the recent incident outside the St Enoch Centre in Glasgow, where a far-right group calling themselves National Action eh, organised a food bank collection for whites only. Can the Minister indicate what steps Police Scotland can and will do to ensure this discriminatory and racist action is stamped out? Minister. Um, I would say to, to the member, to Sandra White, that that kind of behaviour to which you referred is, of course, completely unacceptable. And we, as a government, are committed to, to doing all that we can to stamp it out. Police Scotland are closely monitoring the situation and will not hesitate to take action against hate crime. Question number six, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps the Government has taken since January this year to improve air quality in Aberdeen. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government continues to provide practical and financial assistance to Aberdeen City Council in implementing its Air Quality Action Plan, which has been in place since 2006 and was updated in 2011. Liam Kerr. I thank the Minister for that answer. In January of this year, Market Street, Union Street and Wellington Road in Aberdeen all failed to comply with the Scottish standards for air quality. That month, the Scottish Government said that although there was still much to be done to deliver benefits for human and environmental health, where areas of poor quality remain. To date, there have been no Scottish Government-led initiatives in Aberdeen this entire year that focus on improving air quality. So when will the Scottish Government stop taking Aberdeen and its citizens for granted and deal with the pollution and air quality which seriously affects the quality of life of its citizens? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I do think the member might have taken the small hint from my initial answer um, that it is the Council who has drawn up an air quality action plan. It is the Council who is uh, taking the actions in connection with that, and that is the appropriate way in which to do it. He, he will discover that Aberdeen Council is not the only council uh, who is doing uh, the job uh, that is required of them. We do believe that Aberdeen Council has got a good plan. It has been revised. They are uh, taking the appropriate action uh, where necessary to uh, declare where necessary uh, management areas and we will continue to support them both practically and financially to do the work that they have set out to do. Question number seven, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government what steps are being taken to ensure the Scottish Ambulance Service supports co-responding of emergency services to road traffic accidents? Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The Scottish Government and the Scottish Ambulance Service understand the importance of a combined response from the emergency services to road traffic accidents. The Scottish Ambulance Service, Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service continue to work collaboratively to deliver a joint response to emergencies and public safety remains a key priority for all of our, our emergency services. Richard Lockhead. <clears throat> My constituents, uh, Mr and Mrs McCandy, who tragically lost their son Kieran in a road traffic accident in March when he was cycling, have highlighted that the ambulance control rooms do not routinely alert the fire service of such incidents, even though their appliances are able to get to incidents more quickly with their life-saving equipment. This is despite the emergency services in Grampian sending a memorandum of understanding on such issues in 2010. Will the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary take action to support my constituents' campaign, which they see as a legacy to their late son, Kieran, to ensure all emergency services are properly coordinating the responses? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I say to Richard Lockhead that I met with Mr and Mrs McCandy in the summer and I was uh, very moved indeed by their desire to create a legacy in Kieran's name and improving the response of out-of-hours, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and I said I would do what I could to support their campaign. Um, I think it's important that all of our emergency services do take a joint approach in responding to emergencies. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service will always attend a road traffic accident where there are additional risks such as entrapment of a patient fire or uh, spillage. 
The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and the Scottish Ambulance Service are already conducting trials of a joint response in several parts of Scotland as part of the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy. And I've asked the Fire Service and the Scottish Ambulance Service to consider how the evaluation mm. and rollout of these trials can be accelerated. If there's more, though, we can do, I would want to do that. And I'm happy to keep uh, Richard Walkhead and the McCandys informed of the progress being made. Thank you. And before we move to the next item of business, members may wish to join me in welcoming a number of visitors to the gallery this, this afternoon, including His Excellency Mr Lubomir Rehak, the Ambassador to the Slovak Republic. We now turn to first